You heard that. Welcome, welcome. It's welcome, welcome to a rainy Thursday of media history. What we're what we're going to do for the next week or so, hello, is well, we're going to talk about the 19th century. Um, but first, I'd like to go over. Um, oh yes, and we will have one little quiz. Uh, you know, one of my little extra credit quizzes I will post on Thursday, kind of an incentive to uh, watch the videos or attend class. Um, and then next week we will have uh, a, a, an essay due and we'll go over that in a second. But first, um, I'd really like to go over the test a little bit. As you see, even, okay, we did kind of curve it up, but even so, when you have a bell curve like that, that tells us that it was a fair test. That, you know, that some people did great, some people didn't do great. Let's go over some of the, uh, some of the questions. Okay, folks did know the Sloan and Sloan book was in the developmental school. Cave paintings, you knew that that was media. Again, you know, when we talk about media, we did spend some time going over what we really mean, because this is a class with a lot of different majors. Okay, twice a week in-person class is a form of mass media. No, nope, it's not because you're in person. Writing began, that was good. Now this one was something a lot of folks missed. Uh, Phoenician alphabet, the whole point was you could speak something out loud, actually having an alphabet. So transmission of oral stories, phonics, that really wasn't studied until the 20th century. So that one, that, that one was kind of, I well, just missed that. Early text uses alphabets. Greek culture, this was good. Acta Diurna, that was good. Christianity, Islam spread because it was written down, see? See, you all did pretty good on this. So I, I'm, I'm very pleased overall. The Crusades resulted in everybody got what the printing press did. So bias reporting was a, everyone assumed bias in the time of the revolution. So that's good. First Amendment does not protect us from bias, born, um, bias reporting. Thomas Paine, you know who he was. Now this one, we had a little bit of a, an issue. Um, the time of the Declaration of Independence, free speech wasn't an issue because that was not, just not something that, the, uh, that, that, that either side worried about. The colonists rebelled against British restrictions on speech. No, it was taxes. The British, really weren't um, uh, uh, really weren't big on free speech. So I missed that. You knew who Ben Franklin was. First Amendment established free pre that's good. you got that. Right to redress grievances. Again, we went over the First Amendment so you just look it up. Okay. Meaning of free speech, you mostly got. Okay, prior restraint. I'm very pleased you remembered that. Prior restraint means government should not censor stuff. Zenger, you knew. Alien and Sedition Act. Again, you all did pretty good on this. The First Amendment was to say what the Bill of Rights is what the government can't do. Now, this was interesting. 
elements of mass media include, yep, sources usually an organization, then a person. That there is direct interaction between, no, if there's a direct interaction, then it's really not, you're, you're in a, a live space with them. You need a medium between you and the audience. Mona Lisa, an artist is not, the artist is an individual, not a group sending anything. It wasn't intended for a mass audience. That took a little thought. A lot of people, you know, that's just it. You can, you know, sometimes this is one of the few that I use to really apply um, our knowledge. So that, that was a tough one. Where it was a, again, asked again. No, it was a, a, about really about taxes. First writing began to record business transactions. The Zenger case was free because of his First Amendment rights. No, this was 30 years before the First Amendment. Didn't, he didn't write the articles, but you are responsible for what you produce. So, and we went over that. Uh, okay. Well, I was kind of surprised at this. We, again, we, we talked about that. America was discovered, it stayed discovered. Um, spread Christianity in Arab lands because of the printed Bible. Uh, no, if we remember the spread of Christianity went largely in the other direction toward Europe. The Quran was the um, written uh, work that stayed in the Arab lands. Printing press is considered because it led to the spread of literacy and independent thought. Gutenberg was a follower of Martin Luther. No, uh, Gutenberg predated Martin Luther by a good 60 years. Um, it, Luther was able to reform uh, the, the church because of Gutenberg, it's the other way around. Because of the printing press, the 95 theses were widely circulated and that led to the Protestant. So no, Gutenberg didn't follow Luther. Gutenberg came before Luther. Henry VII licensed printing presses, that is correct. That is good. Protection of free speech from the government, yep. Again, you mostly got, here's a couple of sticky ones, but mostly you did pretty well. No, tradition of free press does not, no, tradition of the, the whole idea of free press. And we went over that really goes back to the development of the American Revolution. That was a big thing here. So anyway, that was the test. My I think mostly y'all did very well, had to curve it up a bit, but it wasn't bad. The next thing we're going to do is, um, like I said, next assignment is next week, because we have our fall break, I'm giving you, we'll, we'll start with it, um, we'll start with it. Uh, I'll start with it this time. Um, and we'll have that set up. Um, in the 19th century, this is our next essay, and I'll set that up shortly. Technologies like the telegraph and the photographic camera change what we do and how we do it. New technologies have unintended consequences. Un unintended consequence of the printing press included the Protestant Reformation. So, Hi, my name is so next week, and I'll post this listening. shortly, but this will be our next assignment due Friday the 15th. And we have time for that. Consider the unintended consequences of any communication technology. Discuss the technology and its intended effects, and then to discuss 
the unintended effects. Remember, keep it focused, back up your assertions with at least an outside choice of source, at least 300 words, more is always welcome. Please make paragraphs. A lot of people have not been putting their essays in paragraphs. To wit, this has been requested by you all. You wonder where the grades come from. Okay, now Canvas doesn't really allow extra credit, but a hundred, I wanna find a way for those of you who really put in the effort to, because a lot of, to, to go above and beyond to give you that credit. At least, at least 400 words when I ask for 300, at least five paragraphs all, and three outside sources, at least not just one. So, I mean, if you do everything right and some extra, then you can get 100. A 95 is just really good. Minimum 300 words and one good outside source, at least five paragraphs, no major errors. Simple as that. Now, uh, a, a, an A minus, very good, but if you have a factual error, more than one time, a lot of people last night will do back, more sure than one issue. More than, hello, please. Hello, please. Um, We'll Mute yourself, somebody's talking. I hear you. Up, so I was studying that. I just tried to get some. We hear you. Anyway, please, please mute. Uh, uh, an A minus, very good. One fact. I, error, more than one. We went time. out to eat and then we had just to get some stuff. Hello. Chandler and yes, please. Jordy took us out to clean their house. Who's on, please. Thank you. I, I did. All right. But my ride was also <laughs> going. There's no excuse for it. Um, okay. I'm going to. Thank you. Didn't know who was on. Appreciate that, Estelle. Uh, a 90 is, you know, very good factual error. More than one topic. A lot of people will have like really two essays in one like the next one when we do unintended consequences you'll talk about sexting and cyberbullying do one not both less than strong outside sources small things these are the small things that that come up and again all of these are a's you know we don't do pluses and minuses is generally speaking a B. Good enough, more than one factual error, poor outside. So this is a big one. Failure to use or outside sources, use or cite your outside sources. It is very important that you just don't pull this stuff out of your butt. Failure to use an outside source. Uh, and when you do it, just don't, just don't list it at the end. Um, you know, use it in the text. A money is, you have a clue, but combination, poor writing, this is how the scale works. There's, you know, there's a lot of ways, a lot of little things can go wrong. Those are just some of the more common ones. Uh, again, one of the big ones is people don't write in paragraphs. Please try to make a, a five paragraph essay. C75, hey, at least you handed something in. This is the real common C's. One paragraph, no outside source, you just threw something at me. You know, you tried, it's, it, it's, it's thoughtful enough. There's really not much less, very hard. You have to be really bad to get a C. I'm really trying hard and I grade these very easily at five points a day late. So that's really, you want to know, everyone wants to know how to get an A and what the issues are, here you go. So uh, I'll keep that. I know, ask for a certain amount, we reached that. 95 is still an A. 
I need to find room for somebody who puts in more extra effort. You know, so I mean, they're still getting A's. So that that that's why that is. So that is, and that's really a canvas thing. So that's how we that's how we do this. So just letting you know, you asked. Anyway, today we're gonna go back to, to, and I give more A's than anything on these assignments. The whole point is to support you. Anyway, we will go into the 19th century. We went up to the revolution. The modern era, do, 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 do. hello. There it is, okay. Okay, here's my thing, okay. 19th century US and also in Europe, often called the age of magazines. Magazine means storehouse heavier paper, things are kept longer. So yeah, that they last longer. What that gave us is a real American voice. People remember time of the revolution, we had an urban population and a, um, you know, and a, and a very literate population. And this is what they started to read. stuff that comes with us today. Washington Irvin, Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Headless Forest. Edgar Allan Poe, who invented the detective novel, the horror story. Again, these- Shall be lifted, nevermore. Mm -hmm. These kind of issues, again, with these new genres, new voices came out of our uh, uh, magazines and the, 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 the expansion of literacy in this country. By the way, you look at these people, they seem real because of photography we will be talking about photography in our next class. He also invented the concept of uh, passive resistance, the idea that you don't have to fight back. You could just say, I do not accept this. It is the passive resistant resistance was used by Gandhi and ML King. So again, these ideas of come from free speech. The fact that he can also, you know, think and promote the kind of things he believes. That's why a lot of these new ideas happened in the United States because they had the right to do so. It was a lot harder in Europe. Whitman, poetry, 
Leaves of Grass, Song of Myself. You know, uh, um, introspection. And yes, Whitman was, uh, was gay. So we have the early LGBT authors. Emily Dickinson's Women, Women's Thoughts, The Bell of Amherst. She, again, wrote about women's lives. You didn't hear much about that until the 1800s. Frederick Douglass. We'll get back to Frederick Douglass. Um, again, publishing books and magazines. Uh, from the perspective of a person of color. Douglas in 1845 wrote his autobiography and people couldn't believe, white people couldn't believe that a, a, a person of color could write or speak as well as he. He was a brilliant person, but the fact that he was able to write and present himself showed that I'm just as good as anybody or he's just as good as anybody. Mark Twain, who started American humor. They still call the humor award the Mark Twain award. Henry James talked about the lives of the upper class. I think I skipped over Nathaniel Hawthorne in there. Uh, Hawthorne, again, gave us the Scarlet Letter. The, um, oh, where did I go? Shush. He gave us, you know, Hawthorne gave us the Scarlet Letter, which later became the movie Easy A. See, these are timeless stories that we still have that came from publishing in the early 1800s. At the same time, in magazines in England, Charles Dickens, if you ever read a Dickens novel, they all come from, um, they're very episodic. They came either in newspapers or magazines in as far as a serial. Uh, humbug. Uh, and then, yeah, we we'll talk about the Americans. And of course, Clement Clark Moore, who more or less invented Santa Claus. Before that, it was for the Christmas. You know, they ate reindeer and all that. Again, early 1800s, American. American creativity, American ingenuity, and American free speech that gave you this, the freedom to be uh, the freedom to be um, uh, to, to creative. Then in the 1830s, we have the high speed press. And this is in your Kavarik book. By the way, yes, we do use the book. Um, they talk about it for chapter one is all about the printing press and he presents it all the press, the press, the press. I'm doing, I'm, I, I'm going over the history of everything chronologically. But anyway, a lot about is the high speed press. All of a sudden. Let's go help people customize and save with Liberty Mutual. No, we don't need Lee. Okay, who's sat at my need. desk? Okay, printing press. I'll show you, okay, a couple of things. Ah, there it is, rolling off the press. Remember with Gutenberg, you have the printing press that you pull out, that you know, stamp and you, you, you pull. The offset press lithography made it just zip right out. How do you think that affected society? Anybody? Huh. 
How do you think that that affected society? We'll get to that. Anyway, and we also talk a lot about newspapers. Why do we talk about newspapers? We talked a little about magazines and books. Uh, we'll talk a lot about newspapers in the 19th century. What, what, why, is, uh, why were the newspapers a big thing? We'll talk about that in a second. American newspapers, 1800 to 1860. City papers. The first half of the 19th century brought dramatic changes in transportation and communications to the US. The introduction of the railroad and the telegraph greatly accelerated the transmission and dissemination of information. At the same time, the demographic structure of the country was changing rapidly, with the population spreading to the west and concentrating in cities. These changes both increased the demand for newspapers and facilitated their production. In 1800, there were 200 newspapers being published in the United States. By 1860, there were 3,000. Many of the new urban papers that were founded in the 1830s and 40s reached unprecedented circulation numbers. According to one estimate, the total annual circulation of all newspapers between 1828 and 1840 doubled from 68 million to 148 million copies. So what do you think that, how do you think that affected people? You have a lot more newspapers, a lot more people reading newspapers. A lot more people can read. And if you remember the beginning of this, um, if, you're, uh, if you remember the beginning of this country, uh, the constitution was written by and for white male property holders. There's not 600, there's not 100, 28 million white male property holders, other people are starting to read. And what do they read is Copies. newspapers. Some scholars also speculate that this expansion of the press was due to increased political participation of the working and See, middle classes, not just higher rates folks, of anyway. literacy, and increased leisure time. There you go. Advances in printing technology, such as the Faudrinier paper making machine and steam printing presses, were equally important since they allowed for newspapers to be printed faster and more efficiently. More people read. At the beginning of the century, journalism in cities was dominated by the political and mercantile press, which tended to cater to particular groups of elite readers. But the 1820s and 30s saw the establishment of many new papers intended specifically for working men, free blacks, women. Look at the different people reading. And it's newspapers because frankly, they're. There's a lot of them, and they're cheaper than books. Women, people of color, immigrants, immigrants and Native Americans, as well, ah. as well as for particular religious denominations. New Choda. Guess what? This was invented very near here. The, 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 the um, Cherokee Indian Sequoia came from around um, Athens, Tennessee, about 40 miles from here. And here you have a paper for the Cherokee Indians. Again, a lot of real history begins to happen here. Speaking of the Cherokees, what happened to them in the 1830s? And what, that, what might that have done have to do with the, the printing press? What happened 1837, 38? Trail of Tears. I was just about to say that myself. Well, you were right. I'll give you credit for that. The, tale, the Trail of Tears uh, was where they, the American government rounded up the Cherokee from North Carolina to North Georgia and Tennessee, 
round them up, them up and put them down uh, and they massed right here in Chattanooga and they were put on boats, went down to Kentucky, crossed the river and then went across Missouri and Arkansas to Oklahoma. It happened here and what that has to do with the press is westward expansion. People were writing about, boy, look at the land and, and farms out in the north and there was gold found in North Georgia and people were reading about that. So the white folks come in and say, we want, a, we want part of that. And, you know, they, and of course, big land speculators, including Andrew Jackson, um, were behind, you know, rounding up the Indians. And the sad thing is the Native Americans and the, the Cherokee were, content, were considered one of the civilized tribes. Look, they had their own newspaper, their own language. Written or political causes like abolition and temperance. Mm -hmm. In this video, we will focus on one of the most significant developments in journalism of this period, the penny paper. The penny press. These one cent daily newspapers that began appearing in the 1830s were cheaper than the six cent mercantile and political papers that preceded them. And they saw a new mass audience of middle and working class readers. They proclaimed their political independence and strove to entertain their readers. They did not invent cheap pricing, the idea of political independence or sensational reporting, but they took these elements of early American journalism and combined them in a new way. In doing so, they became some of the most successful and influential papers of the 19th century. These new penny papers combined major innovations in pricing, distribution, format, and content. Instead of being subsidized by political parties, they began operating independently and targeting new audiences. Instead of merely reprinting foreign news or speeches, they expanded coverage to local news, human interest stories, court reports, and scandals. Partisan papers charged higher prices and also received extra support from political patrons or government printing contracts. Because the penny papers were cheaper and generally didn't receive outside help, they depended more on advertising revenue which was tied to circulation rates. The shift in the business model from offering expensive yearly subscriptions to vending individual copies by newsboys meant that the audience for these papers now included any literate person who happened to be walking down the street. Although the penny papers continued to report on serious subjects like politics and finance, the choice of content was not driven by party affiliation, but rather by what would sell the most papers. Guess what? Doesn't that sound like things today? Anybody know what's going on with Facebook? Again, the folks at Facebook are getting a lot of heat lately because one of their internal people says that, yeah, they will Facebook puts on, uh, they don't stop scandal and wrong stuff from going on and people are getting a lot of misinformation. What gets the most hits? Things that are violent, things that may be sexual, that may twist the lives, the, the ideas of younger people. Should the government do something about that? We were talking about that on the news today. Remember our last unit, free speech and free press. Facebook is not the government. Facebook is a private company. Should the government do something to restrict Facebook? That's the big question. I don't have a good answer. Benjamin Day, who got his start in the working class press, founded the New York Sun in 1833, but its motto, it shines for all, also indicates that he intended to reach a wider audience not limited to any particular group. 
With only three columns, the Sun's early issues were about half as wide and half as tall as the typical political or mercantile papers. Smaller, cheaper, bigger readership. And as they mentioned earlier, and who's included in that readership? Women, people of color, immigrants, working people. I mean, that just opens up the world to all these different people, largely because the mechanization of printing made it cheap and easy. The Sun first popularized publishing police and court reports, which consisted of short descriptions of arrest for drunkenness, theft, and violence. Popular stories like these, delivered in brief paragraphs in a direct style, proved to be an enormous success. The Sun's example was widely copied by competitors. As many as 35 penny papers were founded in New York during the 1830s, but only two, Benjamin Day's New York Sun and James Gordon Bennett's New York Herald, managed to survive the decade. Bennett was one of the most colorful figures of American journalism, and his Herald attempted to surpass the Sun in its sensationalism. The Herald also pioneered the use of specialized columns and sections for financial news, sports, and local, state, and national news. Since the Herald and the Sun soon became major rivals, the two editors often attacked each other's paper, citing errors, delays, and dullness, while proclaiming the superiority of their own publication. Although they claimed political independence, the penny papers were certainly biased, and like the partisan papers of the 18th century. See, all this stuff about bias was um, yeah, expected. Everybody expected the media to be biased. 20s, their content was strongly associated with the personality of the editor. Bennett was especially outspoken. For example, in this column from October of 1835, he taunted the sun, casting aspersions on its success and reputation. Despite their difference in size and content, the Sun and Herald would have looked very much like other city papers. Under the nameplate were nearly unbroken columns of close set type, and there was often no discernible logic in the ordering of news items. Sometimes the items were listed by size or in the order in which they were received. Any illustrations were small and simple and could be repeated many times on the same page. For example, a drawing of a boat could be used to draw attention to all notices about the arrival of ships. Yeah, we can kind of. About local events. Ah, we start. As penny papers became more popular, they often expanded in size and price, eventually becoming as large as their competitors. The Herald grew from four to six columns, and weeklies could grow especially large, as you can see from this comparison of the original Sun in 1833 and the size of its eight-column weekly edition in 1846. When Horace Greeley founded the New York Tribune in 1842, he wanted to make the penny paper respectable. Although the Tribune is often considered a penny paper, it sold for two cents an issue and received support from the Whig Party in order to counter the pro-Democrat slant of the other penny. And it's kind of interesting, in those days, it was that the, the Democrats were the more conservative party and the Whigs who later became the Republicans were the more liberal party. Papers, but Greeley was also too politically eccentric to fit within one party. And he tended to support idealistic causes such as temperance, labor unions, and women's suffrage. Despite their claim to speak for the common man, the Penny Papers also excluded some voices. In the autobiography of Willis Hodges, an early black newspaper editor, describes an incident in 1846 when Hodges wrote a letter to the New York Sun protesting its position on African-American suffrage. According to the autobiography, the Sun refused to print it without a fee, telling him that the Sun shines for all white men only. The following year, Hodges started his own paper, The Ram's Horn, which received support from John Brown and Frederick Douglass. See, in those days, with the penny press, you can reach a wider audience and an audience of color. You have different people starting to read and having their own ideas. 
Because of the time and expense involved, there were few original illustrations in newspapers, and the use of decorative type and white space for emphasis was first seen in advertisements. Illustrations did not become common until the 1850s, and photographs did not appear regularly until the 1880s. Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper was especially famous for its large, eye-catching illustrations. The tremendous growth of the penny papers also had important consequences for their organizational structure and business model. Mm -hmm. New printing presses allowed newspapers to print many more copies much faster, but the high cost of this equipment also made starting a newspaper much more expensive. Newspaper staff also grew in size and became more specialized. The bulk of original material in early penny papers could be written by just one or two people. But by 1845, the Herald had a staff of 13 editors and reporters, in addition to 20 compositors. A large newspaper in the 1850s could employ 100 or more. It's important to remember that despite the tremendous success of the penny papers, the majority of newspapers during the 1830s and 40s were partisan. Until the 1870s, political papers like the Washington Globe, the Albany Argus, and the Charleston Mercury continued to be important sources of information about political speeches, elections, and legislative activity. What took place in 19th century American newspaper publishing was not a simple replacement of one kind of paper by another, but a process of mutual influence. The partisan papers became more like the penny papers by publishing more timely news, seeking wider audiences, and relying more on advertising revenue. At the same time, some penny papers adopted partisan practices, especially as editors became more managerial and had more time for politics. Penny papers often made claims about their own truth and impartiality, but especially in their early years, they were filled with items that later proved to be invented. The most famous example of this was the Great Moon Hoax of 1835, when the Sun published a series of articles claiming that astronomer John Herschel had discovered the presence of trees and rivers on the moon not to mention blue goats and a hybrid race that was half man, half bat. The hoax was finally exposed by the New York Journal of Commerce, but not before the articles had been widely reprinted and the sun's circulation. Hmm, fake news. Isn't that original? ...had nearly doubled. Even when it came to more local news, there was a great deal of room for invention. One of the biggest stories in the 1830s was the trial of Richard Robinson for the murder of Ellen Jewett, a fashionable prostitute. See, One night stuff, in 1836, even, even today, even, you know, crime sells. Jewett's body was discovered in a burning bed with a deep gash in her head. Ooh. The trial attracted unprecedented attention, and the penny papers outdid each other in supplying lurid and conflicting stories about Jewett's upbringing and character and claiming to have inside information about the trial. The penny papers soon spread to other cities. The Boston Herald, the Philadelphia Public Ledger, and the Baltimore Sun were all founded as penny papers in the mid-1830s and early 1840s. Although certain characteristics of the penny paper also spread further south and inland, they were primarily a big city phenomenon. Because large Eastern cities already had established political and mercantile newspapers, the penny papers there had an entrenched rival from which they were compelled to distinguish themselves. In smaller cities in the South and West, however, the divisions between different kinds of papers were less distinctive. The example of Chicago illustrates- Well, again, you've started to have newspapers even here one newspaper in particular, and a newspaper person we will get to at some other time. Illustrates this difference. As distinguished from Eastern cities, penny papers in Chicago met with little success. Instead, the political papers that became dominant in the 1850s, such as the Democratic Chicago Times and the Republican Chicago Tribune, gradually took on features of the penny press, such as sensationalism and the coverage of local news, but also preserved their party ties. One of the closest counterparts to the Eastern Penny Papers was the New Orleans Picayune, established in 1837 by George Kendall and Francis Lumsden, and named for the smallest unit of Spanish currency. It became especially important during the Mexican-American War of 1846 to 1848 as the principal source of information on the war for newspapers across the country. 
One of its most noteworthy contributions to journalism was its use of correspondents, many of them soldiers, to provide the most complete eyewitness coverage of any American war to that time. Like today, city papers circulated beyond their home base. Many city papers were distributed regionally, and the biggest papers circulated across the country, typically as a weekly edition. In the 1840s and 50s, the city papers, especially the New York Weekly Tribune, had become quite successful at attracting country readers. Whereas country papers had traditionally focused on reprinting national and foreign news, they responded to this outside competition from city weeklies by publishing more local news. Mm -hmm. Thus, like the political dailies before them, the country papers also evolved in response to the tremendous popularity of the metropolitan penny papers. The penny press revolutionized the distribution, business model, and content of American city papers, and they set the stage for the newspaper as a mass market commodity. See, at the time, this was the mass media. There was no radio, there was no TV. You had the newspaper. That was your mass medium. This concludes part two of the tutorial. The next video will cover the role of country papers. Yeah, we don't need that. This video that. has been brought to you by. Okay. So you see the difference that it made. Now, again, it really widened the discourse because more people are reading. And if you remember Gutenberg, more people are reading, more different people are reading. And if you remember Gutenberg, that means more people are getting different ideas. like this guy. Give me a second to load. Famed author Frederick Douglass worked tirelessly as an abolitionist and an advocate for equal rights. You can't talk about the history of civil rights in this country without talking about Frederick Douglass. Long before Dr. King, the civil rights movement, here's a man who's talking about basic dignity for people in this country. Born into slavery in Talbot County, Maryland around 1818, Frederick Douglass became educated first through his master's wife and eventually on his own. Douglass escaped slavery in 1838 by fleeing to New York and became a preacher the following year. Certainly during Douglass's time, literacy for Africans was absolutely forbidden. In fact, it was very clear that once Africans could read and write, many wrote their own passes, which allowed them to move from place to place. And obviously this was disruptive to a very repressive system. After his anti-slavery lectures caught the attention of William Lloyd Garrison. And again, here's Douglas, who wrote his own autobiography and had it published in 1845, and showing that a person of color is just as smart and talented and human as anybody. You will know who else is in this picture, female people they're starting to realize that they have rights as well. Harrison, the editor of the abolitionist paper, The Liberator, Douglas began touring the United States as a speaker with the American Anti-Slavery Society. Many whites refused to believe that Frederick Douglass had ever been a slave because he was so obviously intelligent, he was such a powerful speaker. In 1845, Douglas wrote and published his first autobiography entitled Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. Although the book was a US bestseller, Douglas was forced to live in Europe for two years to evade recapture. Yep, we'll talk a little about that shortly. Fugitive Slave Act of uh, 1855 um, said, even if you escape, your does not change your status. He ultimately purchased his freedom in 1847. 
People were shocked about Frederick Douglass, an ex-slave, writing his autobiography. And it was so poignant, and it was such a bird's eye view of what was going on on the plantation. He put it in very plain language, and it was just a powerful testimony of why slavery needed to end in our country. Douglass became the only African American to attend the first women's rights convention in 1848. See? Again, high-speed press, more people reading, more women reading, and more people thinking, hmm, what's going on just ain't right. Again, the power of the press. And by 1861, Douglas was famous nationwide, advising both President Lincoln and Johnson on the welfare of African Americans. By any measure, Frederick Douglass was a real American hero. He was a public intellectual, he was a statesman, he was an activist, and his life and his political commitment were dedicated to human rights, not just to civil rights or to the end of slavery. During his lifetime, Douglas was U.S. ambassador to the Dominican Republic, and in 1872, he became the first African American to appear on a presidential ballot when he was nominated as vice president. Frederick Douglass died on February 20th, 1895 from natural causes. Again, different voices, people hearing and seeing different voices. I got one more different voice for you. We talked about this about the Fugitive Slave Act, even if you leave slavery- Not long still... after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, mm -hmm. a runaway knocked on the door of a house in Brunswick, Maine. As fate would have it, he had come upon the new home of Harriet Beecher Stowe and her family, including a newborn named after the baby they had buried in Cincinnati. Stowe was well aware of the punishment facing anyone who helped a runaway but she was glad of the opportunity to defy the government. Before this law, I might have tried to send him somewhere else, she wrote her sister. As it was, all hands in the house united in making him up a bed. Like many Northerners, Stowe was deeply disturbed by the fugitive slave law. For her, its cruelty was all too real. Every account of flight, of capture, tore at the agonizing memory of Charlie's death. My heart breaks at the cruelty and injustice our nation inflicts on the slave. I am tormented by the thought of the slave mothers whose babes are torn from them. I pray to God to let me do a little and to cause my cry for them to be heard. Leaving Cincinnati allowed Harriet to look back at those 18 years there and to process that experience of the slave riots, Charlie's death, the fugitive slave law, and it all came together in a vision. Instead of Christ on the cross, she saw an image of a slave being whipped. And she wrote the ending of Uncle Tom's Cabin when Uncle Tom dies. And when she read it to her family, they were all crying and they said, Mama, you've got to write the rest of the story. On March 20th, 1852, a publisher released a book on a difficult subject by an unknown author. By the end of the week, Harriet Beecher Stowe's novel about the evils of slavery had sold 10,000 copies. Within two months, 50,000. Again. Look at all of those people reading about Uncle Tom's Cabin. Why that's significant is, again, like Frederick Douglass. She is showing that enslaved people are people. Uncle Tom is now considered a, a pejorative term, but he was the patriarch trying to keep his family together. At, during it was he's a very complicated character, the character of Eliza with, with with the baby, trying to bring her child to freedom. 
um, the, the issue comes up of whether or not a person of, you know, of skin tone, lighter or darker people, should a lighter person try to be, uh, should try to pass for something they're not. Again, lots of issues came up in this book, which was the most popular book in America. And all of a sudden, people in New York or Massachusetts see enslaved people not as slaves, but enslaved people. Three paper mills feeding three printing presses running 24 hours a day. And still the publisher couldn't keep up. Soon, Uncle Tom's Cabin began reaching vast new audiences, including many who had never read a novel when it was adapted as a wildly popular play. All right. You see, all of a sudden, all of these people reading about slavery. And the politicians see that it becomes a big issue. And of course, and it's no coincidence, that then you get elected a person who's pretty hardcore on slavery, Abraham Lincoln, who came to Harriet Beecher Stowe and said, hey, this is the little lady who got us into this war because again, everyone knew about, yeah, you heard about slavery. But then when you hear through the media that enslaved people are people, mind blown. So power of the power of the printed word just blows up all over the place because of the technology and the unintended uh, consequences or like the Civil War. We will talk more about that in the future. Next time, at the same time, we have photography. So we will talk about photography next time. Questions on what's up and coming. Again, I'll, I will post the, the uh, next week's essay when we're done this afternoon. Uh, you can send me early drafts. We will have a little extra credit quiz I'll post Thursday just to keep you going. So that's what we're up to. Any questions? Okay, well, thank you for joining us. Have a lovely rainy afternoon. Yes, peace out, Quentin. <laughs> okay, we will talk to you then.